right, welcome back. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so we're gonna take a look at how to do one, or we're gonna do a couple um, items. So we're gonna do a service item and we'll probably do one inventory part item. But like I said, once you can do one, the rest should be rinse and repeat. It's basically the same thing. You're gonna do it over and over again. It's the same concept over again. Now, let's talk about the two, the two main ways that you're going to be able to access the um, items list, okay? All right, right here on your homepage, you have it right here under company, items and services, right? You click on that icon straight to the icon, the um, the items list. Okay. Of course, and the other way that you could do that as well is you can go up to list. Right. It's a list, and um, right here is the the second one is going to be your items list. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, we're going to also briefly talk about um, all these other lists here. So after we figured out how to do the. Um, Items list, we'll talk about price level list, sales tax codes, payroll items, class lists, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's actually pretty cool what these lists can do. But for now, we're only mainly focused on the one and only item list. Okay? okay. So here we are, items list. And just exactly how we created the chart of accounts is identical to creating a new item as well. Down at the very bottom, instead of account, it says item. Yes, you can just go ahead and click that drop down menu and you have the new right there. So everything is kind of uh, standard as in regards to you need to add something, go down to the bottom right there, pop up that little uh, drop down arrow and then you first thing you should have on there is new. Okay, same thing here too. We can click anywhere on the um, on the items list and you'll be able to create a new item at the very top, okay? So that's the only two ways that you can do that. There is one more way, um, but um, it's through the inventory, um, the inventory center, which uh, it is, I have, I actually have um, Pro 2019, so I don't, uh, and the, the thing about 2018 and 2019 is we actually got rid of the inventory center because if you can, you can do everything in the items um, list. So what's the point of having an inventory center? But that doesn't mean that they completely excluded it out. So if you do go under your vendors um, menu bar and you go to inventory activities, you can create a new item right there. Okay, but that's going to be something we're going to be learning in chapter eight. So um, definitely um, it is a way, um, but um, it's definitely something we're going to talk about in chapter eight because it is going to be to dealing with the, with uh, making purchases of the inventory items that we create. So, um, yes. So with that being said, that is how you get to the items list. All right. And like I said, straightforward and pretty um, pretty easy, right? We're gonna come down here and we're gonna go ahead and click new. So once you get that, you're gonna get this window here. So this is different from the account window, right? Cause the account window, we had a few other things that we have to go around. This one is straightforward and pretty easy. So how we fill this one out is the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna give us a drop down menu to determine what kind of type we are looking at. So again, I only have nine out of the 10 items. Reason being is because I have Pro, um, Premier Accountant and um, Enterprise. Um, they have the luxury to include the um, inventory assembly. For 2000, uh, for Pro, I do not have that option. So, so uh, yours, you'll have an extra item on the list. But here, it's pretty straightforward. You have every single item that exists in QuickBooks, which is the exact, uh, well, for me, it's nine, but it's the exact 10 items that are listed in your book. The service, inventory, non-inventory, other, charges, subtotal, group, um, discounts, payments, sales tax item, and a sales tax group, right? Okay. So the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to click service because that's what it first asks me to do. 
Okay, so once I've clicked the service, right? Now, if, if you go through the down the line, it does each one has a different format or different type of um, things that you need to know in order to set it up, but that's okay. Once you've done one, it's all, you just have to just go through the questions and um, pretty much fill in what you need to fill in. So the first thing it's gonna ask me is, what is the name of the service? So let's go ahead and check out in this book. I believe I am um, entering a, um, uh, I'm entering a photo session, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, let me see. Let me see where the title is. Uh, where am I? I think it was right there with service items. All right, yeah, I, I'm looking at that too, but hold on. It says right here, service items. It says that uh, you're going to select service items, and then you're going to create in figure 7.3. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, okay, all right, so it says right here, photo, uh, photo, um, yeah, photo session, right? Mm -hmm. And, of course, your description is going to be uh, pretty straightforward. It's a photo session, Okay. So details that are into dealing with this item itself is um, when we're coming, when we're uh, entering in here. So I'm going to go ahead and enter in that this is a photo ses session, All right? That's what I'm going to name this item or name this service. Photo session, All right? If it's a sub item, which I didn't talk about too much about that, is that what a sub item is, is if you if you have multiple items that go underneath the photo session. So let's say I have a photo session, right? The what can go under there could be um, a two hour photo session, three hour photo session, four hour. Like, you know what I mean? I could create mm -hmm. sub items. So basically my main uh, account or my main item is a photo session but i can break it down even further maybe it could be based on location i could say indoor i could say outdoor i could say public or it's more specific um a um a set like i have to create a set um so things like that if it's if it makes it easier for you so you can break down your um your each item um with a sub item if you'd like but, of course, I'm not going to do that, so I'm not saying that it is. Um, other things, it says that this surface is used in assemblies. Now, of course, in this case, it's not made up or it's not a part of, um, it's not part of a, 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 an overall um, uh, item or service that we're uh, providing. So, in this case, I'm not going to click on that. Then it asks you, well, what is your description? So, pretty straightforward. It is going to be a photo session. Okay. Um, and, and then, of course, this one, the description doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be word for word. But in this case, let's see what the, it really says. Um, it says it here, photo session service. Pretty straightforward. I just wrote a photo session service. All right. Um, you can get into details of what it entails, such as maybe you can add in there. Um, it comes, it, it, it's a, um, a photographer is included, et cetera, et cetera, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So then the next section is now it's going to ask you, um, so the small section on the right side here, it gives you a rate. Now you can choose, it doesn't have to be a rate per se, um, uh, but this is dealing with your sales account, okay? Because you are providing a service, right? You have to either um, set a price point or again if you leave this blank then every time you fill in um, an invoice you're going to um, arrange a specific um, you know number every single time but most cases when you are doing business you should have a set price list of everything or at least a set uh, at least a minimum for most things but let's say if they ask for a if they ask for a specific uh, you know, photographer or they want a custom photo shoot, then that's where you can go ahead and leave this section blank. So then you can, um, you know, weigh out what your options and how much is going to cost you in order to provide that service. 
So in this case, I believe it's $95. And as often, most times. So this is where we're going to talk about later. What is a sales tax code? Okay, sales tax code is going to be based on a few things, right? So if I drop down my menu, as I can see here, I have government tax. I have NF, uh, non-for-profit taxes. I have a QQS at a state, right? I even have um, uh, other things here too, right? In this case, it's a service. And as we know, services are tax exempt. Because the one thing that services do provide is a possibility for tips. Okay, so just because you're not being taxed, you there is a factor where the person can get tipped, right? They accept tips. So that's a little factor here that you need to know, right? And when you set up your sales tax code, right, it's really going to be depending on what um, uh, circumstances you want to provide your products to. So again, we have government, right? Government, right, is for like, let's say for military, they get taxed at a lower rate because, hello, they work for the government or, or you know, things like that. So that's what a tax code is. It breaks down on what um, eligibility uh, a certain uh, either person or uh, whether your product or service is going to be taxable. Most 100%, if not all, um, products are going to be always taxed, okay? Unless you're doing a circumstance where it is out of state, then uh, it's going to be taxed whatever state that they belong in. Uh, but, and then um, I'm not quite sure about a non-for-profit, how much they tax on. Um, it's, I, I, I feel like it's, uh, it's almost close to zero, but it's not exactly zero, or they're not exactly tax exempt, but they do get a few, um, they do feel, they do get a discount on the tax, uh, or they get a special tax, I'm sorry, um, when you sell a product to those kind of organizations. Uh, and then another one too is if you wanna also place in this in here too, if since um, Academy Photography, they don't sell groceries, they don't sell food, right? So a, a potential tax code could be for, um, you know, non-perish, I mean, was it? I forgot what the word is called, but um, if you have perishable foods, it's ab or any foods in general, absolutely oh, yeah. tax free. Uh, I can't think of it now to say that either. It's on the tip of my tongue, but <laughs> yeah, it's not tax exempt. It's a uh... oh. it's a special tax that they don't they don't get taxed. Yeah, I'll find it later. On. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Yes, and then other things too, like right, out like alcohol and um, including um, tobacco. Tobacco has a special tax. So yeah, so the, that, that's, that's what a tax code essentially is. You're just taxing at a specific rate. Um, and then in this case, because this is going to be in towards my sales perspective, I'm going to indicate that this goes directly into my sales account, okay? Because of the service. It's under services. Oh, it is under services? Oh, okay, my bad. Yeah. No, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. I was right. gonna ask you about that. I was like, why is it? No, 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 you're right, you're right, services. Why, why wouldn't it be under services? The whole thing is a service uh, thing. Okay, so um, this, 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 this account right here, service, is actually underneath revenues. So that's why I said, uh, my initial thought that this is a sale because um, when you provide a service, you're getting money, you're gener gener generating revenue. And um, in fact, that if you actually look down at this, uh, it, if you break it down and actually look into this account, it is a revenue slash income item. It's part of sales. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That was my, that was my mistake. Yes, it is services. Yes, because uh, like we also sell products, so products are going to be more towards the sales aspect, where this is more towards service. So you're right here. So again, we're going to tax them at service because you don't tax them at all. It's going to be tax exempt. All right, and then that's it. That's all I have to do when I do that. Once I confirm and everything, I'm going to click OK, and there it is, my photo session service item. That easy. Okay, when we move into chapter four and chapter uh, two and as well as chapter eight, we're actually gonna be looking at how you use these items 
to um, either uh, create a sales form to either bill um, or, you know, to receive a bill or to even make purchases of um, inventory or whatever it is, right? So in this case, I'm just showing you how to create it. And this step needs to come first before anything else can happen. Now, I'm also going to show you in chapter four and chapter two is that if in case you don't have the item, you can create it as you go. But the dangers about that is if you type in that you don't have this item and you want to click at it, the only problem is that what if I accidentally have three of uh, like two, I created another account when I have an account that existed that is exactly what I wanted. It, it's oftentimes, especially when you use the fill in feature, which I'll tell I'll show you on uh, tomorrow because tomorrow is chapter four. The fill in feature is every time you type in something, it will automatically highlight and try to predict what you're trying to type in. That is uh it's to help you make it's it's helped you fill out the forms a lot quicker but it's also a downside because sometimes a lot of times oftentimes people they type in the first three letters and they get boom that's it and then they they don't it, it takes them a while to check back at them saying oh shoot i hit the wrong item i meant to buy this instead so um again it's, it's, it's a good benefit, but it can also, you know, it's also bad as well. So yeah, there you go. Sure. The autofill. Right, so there's, there's no, uh, uh, you have to look at it. You can't just go with what it starts to autofill it with because it will be wrong a lot of times. Oftentimes, yeah, but like I said, like a lot, when a lot of people do their jobs, like oftentimes they kind of want to rush through it or they're, or they're in the middle of like uh, filling out a, a sales form. Sometimes they'll just have to do it so quickly, right? Because the customers, they're waiting for you. They're not going to wait forever for you. They expect you to get the job done within the first minute or two or process their uh, invoice or process their sales receipt right then and there. So you can't spend like your sweet time filling out your the forms for you for them it's going to be usually generally a lot quicker and you know like i said sometimes those mistakes happen it's common people make typos all the time so that's exactly the and the the same concept here is people make typos all the time sometimes i wanted to write in photo paper i accent i actually grab or one of the examples is i wanted a photographer i end up clicking on photos uh photo paper instead so there's a lot of things that you can uh, come into error errors when it comes to these things. And we'll talk about that in chapter 13 and how to correct those errors. Okay. So there you go. That was the first example to show you how to create a, a service item. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and skip this subcontracted service uh, just because it's not really... Um, necessarily unless you do have a subcontractor or a 1099 worker that's linked to a specific item. So, I mean, if you could go ahead and read along, you're just basically going to um, click on that. This item is part of an assembly and basically you're going to fill in um, who that third party vendor is or who that subcontractor is, but still reflect the same amount in the service. Okay, so I'm going to skip that for now, um, but let's go ahead and talk about inventory part versus non-inventory part. So here, they showed you that we're going to create um, a uh, non-inventory part because in when we go dive into chapter 8, we're going to be taking a look at actual entering an inventory part. And how do we use it? So in this case, it's already being taught in chapter eight. We're in chapter seven right now. So um, it's, you know, it's supposed to go in order. So um, they're just assuming that you don't, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn it in the next chapter. All right. So um, that's why they didn't have that section. So what I'm going to show you is a non-inventory part. So again, a non-inventory part is where you don't sell this product as often as um as normal or as usual maybe you are you sell this um specific um item every every once in a while or every special occasion right so um when you have these kind of items um again 
you don't care to keep track for it too much. You care to just uh, sell it every once in a while, okay? Or you, you don't care to keep track of either, like, um, what do you call it? Uh, restocking. You don't care for too much for it because it's, it's, it's an item that um, you don't sell. I keep repeating myself. All right, so here we're going to create a custom photo package. All right, so with this custom photo package, um, it's going to be um, a non-inventory part. So let's go ahead and do that example again. So how do I create an item, a brand new item? Go down to item. Mm -hmm. Go up to new. Yep. And then we're going to go ahead and select non-inventory part. Okay. What we're going to do is we're creating a custom photo package. Okay. So again, it's the, it, just by the word itself, custom photo package, you're not going to sell this all the time. Right? Because it's custom. It's a, it's a custom. It's made for a particular person. So custom photo package. And again, I'm going to fill in my description as well, saying that this is a custom photo package. Okay. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what the um, description says. It says that here um, we are creating the custom photo package. And this time, because it's a custom photo package, we don't know what the customer wants. Maybe they want to add a few things. Maybe they want to take away a few things. It's custom. So therefore, we cannot put a price point because we don't know what the cost is going to be for us if they want a specific custom package. It could be like, I want a four hour session, but I want, you know, three picture frames, one from each session. So it's going to be built and tailored based on that person. And in, in this case, this custom photo package could be subjected to tax because we just don't know what this um, package is going to entail. Maybe they want, um, they want four picture frames, you know? So in this case, we're leaving, we're leaving the price because we, we can't determine it yet where it could be subject to tax. Maybe it could be a service and a product. We don't know. And then, of course, the account, though this one's going to be sales because uh, we at this point right now, um, this package we're assuming is going to, since it's a non-inventory item, it's not particularly a, um, it's not particularly, um, a service. So at least in this conclusion, we know that this item must be taxed and um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a product we're selling. So therefore, it's going to go straight into our sales account. Right? And that's it. <laughs> you click OK and there it is. That's how easy QuickBooks makes it so much easier for you to create your items. Now, of course, before even going into business and you're trying to set up something, the first general rule of thumb is know what your company is going to sell, whether it's a product or a service. Now, what kind of products? Well, I don't know. You have to tell me, right? It's your business. So tell me, what do you sell? And if you want to sell it, then that's where you need to have a list of things that you potentially do sell. And that's where um, building this is going to be a lot more easier to do, especially when you have all those um, information. Okay. So again, so there you go. Um, that is how you create a non-inventory part. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's a very, a very small part of it, but yeah, it's a. Yep. Don't worry, we're going to keep going. <laughs> so, um, uh, let me see, other charges. Um, okay, so for sure, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do this other charge. So, other charges, right? We as we mentioned before, right? If you decide to charge your um, customer, um, you know, a delivery fee or shipping and handling or um, 
et cetera, et cetera. Usually you would do other charges for that. Or if they miss their payment, right? You can charge them an additional fee for a late payment. You can create that and it's going to be conclude it's going to be um, categorized as an other charge. So again, most common ones that you would normally see would be like delivery. Um, so for this example here, um, we are actually going to be um, do we're going to be entering a shipping and handling fee or in this case it's just shipping. So because of this reason, uh, we uh, are going to charge our customers shipping. Okay, because maybe they had an online order. So again, how do we create a new item? Go down to item. Go down to item. Go up to new. New. All right. We're going to do other charges. Other charge, yeah. Yes. So it okay, no worries. So we are going to be doing shipping. Okay, now of course, shipping could be standard depending on where you go. Now, if you're if you're not worried about um, the exact measurements or whatever it is, uh, what happens is that what you can do is if you potentially know how much it's going to cost you to ship a specific item, then um, that's where the price point is going to be about right there, about a certain percentage. Now, of course, when we're looking at shipping, shipping is based on either weight or size of the box, depending on which one is more expensive. Um, so that, that's accordingly to there. Now, of course, if we have our own shipping agency or we have our own uh, vendor for shipping, then, you know, they might charge us a flat rate. OK, or for most cases, like if I if you buy anything, doesn't matter how much you buy it, it's going to be a standard eight dollar shipping. Okay, cool. Even if you purchase one item for like five dollars, ship, shipping still to, shipping will still be eight dollars. So it just really depends on how you look at it. But if you have those kind of um, shipping services, you definitely want to look into it. Is it based on? Are you going to take it to um, UPS? If you're going to take it to UPS, they're going to either charge you based on size of the box or how heavy the item is, right? So you got to pick and choose on what is a good amount. Now, of course, again, you can always test it, right? You could always take your box and put items in it and say this is potentially what it should, um, a customer should want. And then from there, you go to UPS and they say, hey, I'm going to charge you $8. Okay, because you have that, um, you got that information from the UPS store, then the next person that tries to buy something from you, they, you know, you charge them the eight dollar shipping. So this is where we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about well, we're gonna we're gonna charge our customers um, a charge fee, and in this case, um, it's going to be um, it's going to be a service, obviously, because um, in this case, uh, I believe we have a third party vendor or a, uh, we're not going to use UP, US, UPS. We actually have our own delivery services. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and whoa, remind me later. Um, so then here we go. Um, so description is shipping. and handling. Okay. Okay. All right, and of course, it's not based on a percentage, so I don't know why it says based on a percentage, but in your book, it says it's 8.95 uh, percentage. Now again, uh, in this case, this could be overridden, you know, or um, it's not based on a percentage. It could be a flat rate, like I said. So in this case, you could just ignore that percentage and just say it's going to be based on 8.95. Um, okay. And of course, um, shipping is non-taxable. Oops, excuse me. I hit the wrong one. It's shipping is non-taxable. Okay. You can never charge a uh, tax or D or even um, have a discount on shipping. Shipping is just a flat extra fee that just comes uh, with the cost. So here, 
um, account is going to be service. Okay. And that's it. Okay. So that's how it is. And like I said, once you know how to do one, every time you enter in something new, whether it's a different type of um, account, it's pretty straightforward. It's more or less the same thing. They try to make it as universal, as user-friendly as possible. So um, again, when we go dive into chapter eight, that's where we got to, we're going to take a look at looking at how to enter in an inventory part. And when you de enter that in, you're going to notice that an inventory part's going to have multiple sections that you need to um, you need to have, such as cost of goods sold, right? You need to you need to have a place to to um, to determine how much it costs you to sell the item. All right. Also, another place is um, you need to know where your revenues are going to be coming from, right? You need to know where you're going to be collecting the money from. And then lastly, you need a place to um, to know where to take out the inventory from. So you need to have the inventory asset account, right? So uh, we'll talk about that again in Chapter 8, which is in two weeks from now. So nothing you need to know now. It will come later, all right? Last but not least, I want to talk to you about how sales tax works, all right? Um, since you were from another state, um, you are pretty, I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, um, that every state has their own tax, but including the local government has their own tax. So it just really depends on where your shop is located. Um, and um, the reason why we have a sales tax item and a sales tax group item is that because um, the real uh, thing behind it is that when you make payments to your agencies, right, when you pay your sales tax uh, to the government, you know, if it's all in one location, so let's say I'm in the state of California and uh, um, I'm, in sa I'm doing sales in Sacramento. Sacramento is the capital of California, you're more likely to submit your sales tax to both the state and the Sacramento County or Sac yeah, Sacramento City all in one area, okay? Or all in one agency. But for example, if I'm, um, if I'm, I, um, I have my California um, sales tax, right? And I live in Orange County, I have to pay to my Orange County local agency and I got to pay my state one in probably LA or something like that. Just an example. So if I have to make two payments to different to two different agencies, that is the reason why we have an, um, a sales tax group item. Okay, so for this example, we're going to do this one together. Okay, we're going to create two sales tax items. And then we're going to create a sales tax group. All right. So first things first is, um, um, are you, um, we're gonna create a new um item. So let's go ahead and click that new button, and let's go ahead and click that sales tax item. All right. In this one, I'm gonna call this Nevada state tax. Okay. Okay. Um, Nevada state tax. Okay, and of course, the description for Nevada state tax is pretty straightforward. Sales tax, right, for Nevada. I'm going to do NV for short, okay? Now, the first thing it's going to ask you is, what's the tax rate at? Now, because I'm looking at just the state and just the state only, it's only 4.6%, okay? Okay. And what tax agency, of course, um, you can make it up, of course, if, if it is one. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and see what they have. I believe this one says equal um, state of board of equalization. Okay, that's just what they have on there. Um, obviously, when you're uh, filing or having to 
collect sales tax, you're going to actually send it to the correct uh, agency. So, uh, but in this case, this is just a, this is just a fictitious scenario. So here you go. 4.6% and state board of equalization. And I'm going to click OK. But you're going to probably be like, but wait, isn't sales tax 8.37% right now? It is. And I'm going to tell you why. Because that was just the state tax. We got to create another item to calculate for how much Clark County is going to charge us. So again, we're gonna create a second sales tax item. And this time I'm gonna name this as Clark County. Okay, Clark County. And of course it says sales tax for Clark County. Okay. And of course, let's go ahead and see what that percentage is. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it is going to be three point, let's see, it is 3.78%. 3.78%. All right. And again, because I'm going to be using this a fictitious one again, um, I'm going to say it's the state of Board of Equalization. And I'm going to click OK. So now I have two sales tax items. I have one to charge for Nevada, and I have one that charges for County Clark. For Clark County, excuse me. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a new item again. and But this time, instead of clicking on a sales tax item, I'm going to create a sales tax item group item. And of course, what am I going to call this? I'm going to call this Clark, um, Clark County, uh, or actually I could do CCNV tax or sales tax, right? Because in my, I know what CC stands for. It stands for Clark County. NV sounds for, for Nevada sales tax. Okay. So then there you go, sales tax. And now because I've created the items from before, that's exactly what I'm like be picking up here. So I'm going to type in right here, Nevada. I misspelled it. Nevada state tax. Boom. There's my 4.6%. I'm also going to ta tag in my Clark County right here for my 3.78%. And now... My new grand total is 3.8, uh, uh, 8.38%, um, which is currently what um, uh, Clark County is actually currently right now. It's actually 3.75% if I'm not wrong, but um, that's okay. That's what I have here, and that's exactly what it is going to be charged in this area, Okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So every time I charge my tax, right, it's going to automatically reflect. If I select this, right, it has to be the, the CCNV state sales tax. It's going to charge 8.38% every single time. All right. All right. Now, when everything's been set up by accountants, when they set up, you know, the, I'm sure they set up a lot of your things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for your lists and things, uh -huh. that's probably already going to be in there, I would imagine. Um, yes, if, 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 if you're the bookkeeper or you're not the accountant, then yes, um, because they have to do a lot more research because, again, you have if you if you do plan to do out of state services, you have to go to you have to look up every single information on every single state. Um, and et cetera, et cetera. So again, they do a lot of the, uh, the accountants does the majority of the work. Now they can also say, Hey, you, here's a list of all the sales tax, enter them in. Then, you know, then you're doing scut work, right? You're entering in all those information that you could potentially use. So you're probably spending there, sitting there, creating every single item there is. So, um, yes, but most cases, if you are not the accountant, that should be standard, that it should be there all already for you. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Good. 
right? Any questions? So that was just items right there. No, I think I got that. Okay. So now that we had went over items and we went over um, the sales tax items, we're gonna now go over the list that you can do. So again, um, we talked about how to get to the items list, right? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to actually view that list um, that we've just created, right? So in this case, we're actually gonna go to our um, report at the top. Now this is a little more towards uh, chapter six, but every single chapter is going to see what you can do for every single section. So again, when we look at um, our vendors tomorrow, you're going to see what kind of reports that in that are that deal with your vendors, right? You can make a list of all the accounts accounts payable that they owe you uh, or you can or that you owe them, excuse me. Um, you can also make a list of just the vendor contact list itself, right? Who are your vendors? Um, we And those are all reports that are going to be considered something that could be helpful for your position. So I'm going to mention this a lot and a very often is that it's really going to depend on the position that you are. If you're the sales representative, then your reports are probably most likely going to be looking at anything that deals with sales. You're not going to be looking into your customer, I mean, your um, vendors list. Why do you need to know your vendors list? You're, you're dealing with your sales. So um, again, but because QuickBooks is like this and they're teaching you basically all the aspects of QuickBooks um, uh, and also doing every almost every position, it takes a look at someone who does the accounts receivable section, the accounts payable, the human resources, um, inventory management, they do all of it, all right? And they also teach you to be the main accountant as well, whether you're a general ledger, general journal, general accountant. Um, they teach you everything here. So my duty is to also show you as well what you can do. So again, one of the reports that they want to show you see is now that we've created our inventory or I'm sorry, our item list, you can actually um, view it by going to reports at the top of the window or at the top of uh, on the menu bar um, you could drop down all the way to lists and then you can see your items price list you can see your item listings um or item price listings as well but i believe they'd want item listing so here it gives you a list of all the items it gives you the descriptions and it gives you what type they belong into and what they cost you so this is pretty useful especially if you are in sales because you need to make sure that your items that you sell in your store they reflect of what price that you set them at so it's also a good way to also double check too if you if you're um your accountant decides to give you a list and say, well, this is what the boss wants to sell. So make sure that you double check this list with this list and you entered everything in there. That's what you can do as well. And of course, every single report that you want to view, you just go right out to the top and you can print them just right then and there. Okay. Okay. And the great thing is too, is because we are living in the digital age, you can print them as a PDF. You don't have to actually physically print them. You can save them as a PDF and send them to people if they need to be double checked and what so on and so forth. So again, this uh, QuickBooks now it's becoming a lot more uh, digital friendly, as we all know. Um, you know, paperless statements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, everything's a little. Everything's a little electronic nowadays. So, uh, but again. Printing is in regards to keeping your records, okay? Because you can never trust the internet or trust um, the computers uh, because they can break down at any given time or you just don't have internet, etc., etc. So it's always good to have a physical backup copy for any reason. Um, so they, they give you, they allow you to print it or they allow you to print it as a PDF. So yes, you can print out your sales items list, okay? All right, let's see what the next section is. So we're gonna talk about the other list that we talked about earlier. 
So one of them is being the terms list. All right, so when we have people owe us or if we owe other people, right? General rule of thumb is what terms really does is it's just an incentive for whoever is you're looking at, whether it's a vendor. So if it's a vendor, the vendor would give you terms to give you an incentive to take, a, to take advantage of a discount with the catch of that you're going to pay them all in advance or pay them all at once. Okay, so that's just to ensure um, payment. Okay, that's all that it really truly is. Same thing for us as well. We can also um, give terms to our customers so they pay us in full. And if they take advantage of the time period or, you know, if they pay us uh, before their deadline is due, we give them an incentive. And that's what terms is. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at an example of what terms are and what they do. So I'm going to go to lists at, on my menu bar and, um, and I'm going to go ahead and click on terms. Uh, where is terms? Terms, 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 terms. Uh, sales tax uh, payable class uh, customer and vendor. Oh, it's going to be customer and vendor. All right, there it is, terms list, okay? So under customers and vendors, then you have terms list. Now, what does these numbers even represent? Now, the catch is that I'll offer you a 2% discount off of whatever you, whatever you purchased from me, okay? If you pay within 10 days, and if not, the whole bill is due in 30. Okay, so again, these terms, they're only meant for whoever the person is to give them an incentive to pay quicker and to guarantee that they pay in full. Okay, um, uh, it's different than having someone make a monthly payment or payment plan because um, that one you're going to have to charge interest on top of that and it's a percentage. You don't, you, you generally would not give them any discount if they decide to um, agree to a payment plan with you. Okay, so that's the, just make sure that you understand there's a difference between owing money and making a payment off of it. And then um, this one where it's a straight bill, but they give you a little incentive to say, hey, um, I'll throw in a discount if you pay me in full in 10 days. So that's exactly what this is. Now notice this, I'm gonna go ahead and create one. And if you didn't, if you don't wanna give incentives or you just don't wanna give discounts out, you can just say the bill is due in 30 days. Okay, that's what net means. It just means at the end of the day, it's due that day, it's due that time. So now the, it, the moment this is uh, related or transferred, right? Net 15 means as of the day that you sent that invoice is going to be 15 days after that it's due. So most cases, right, when you, um, uh, when you don't sign up for a payment plan, they'll just say, hey, I'll let you owe me, but you only have 30 days to pay me back. All right. And usually it happens at time where they receive the bill or usually they give you, they, they usually send out it, um, couple days before the 30 months is due so that's what terms is it's just basically um um basically it gives you the time that you have before the bill is due okay so of course same thing here how do we create a new term down to terms new yes pretty straight Forward. Now, notice that, um, I, well, let me click cancel real quick. I'm going to create a new one. Um, notice that I don't have any 15s, net 30. So this one, I'm going to kind of go off the book for this one. Um, and I'm going to make up my own terms. I'm going to say this is going to be called 5% 15 net 30, right? So what does that even mean? It means that um, it's not a standard one. It's one I'm creating. It's going to be net due in. So how many days is it due in? It's due in 30 days, okay? But if I give them a discount, right, I'm going to give them a 5% discount. 
And uh, when is the discount period? It's within the fifth for uh, the first 15 days. If not, they have to pay the whole thing in full in 30. And there you go. That's pretty much all you have to do when you click OK. So if I were to go ahead and post this to other people that I send my invoices to, they're going to be like, wow, 5%, that's a huge discount, you know, especially if um, it, you'll see in this kind of case, um, a photo session is $95. That's a lot. Exactly. And you're expecting your customer to pay the whole thing in 30 days. Um as much as crazy it sounds, I mean, that's what that's what you get when you are doing something a little fancy like a photo shoot. Um, so, yeah, if you offer a 5% off of um, almost a $100 thing, that's $5 off. That's a lot. So, um, you know, to, that, that's a good advantage or a good incentive for the customer to want to pay back. And I gave them at least two weeks. Two weeks. Pay me back in two weeks. And if you don't, then, you know, you just have to pay the whole thing in um, 30 days so that is what terms is that's what they do and that's how you do the terms list okay let's see what else we have here okay um, 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 um. price levels okay price levels is a little tricky um it's meant for if you, in case you do have um, specific people that you're going to charge price levels at. So we'll go ahead and take just a little gander at um, the list here. So again, price levels. Okay. So for example, here they tell you that you have a non-for-profit and you have a frequent customer and you also have a commercial customer. So... In this kind of sense, it's like you're, um, especially when you are working with a corporation, you can charge them a nice, decent price because they're willing to pay. But if you're going for someone who's local, like a resident, you know, they're not, they're, you, you want to try to lower your price for that because they're not going to be willing to pay that much because, again, they're local, they're residential, they don't, they can't really afford it. So that's what these are for, right? Or for a non-for-profit, right? Um, non-for-profits, I believe um, you can use that as a write a tax write-off if you work for a non-profit or if they uh, provide a service for you or you provide a service for them. You can actually, um, it, it, it helps you in the long run. But for those kind of people, you also have to give them like a, a special discount for. You can't expect them to pay for in full because, again, they're not commercial. They don't have all the money that they can spend for it. But they have enough to get by because, again, they're solely based on, um, you know, um, membership dues or fundraisers, right? They can't be glamorous and pay uh, the full amount for all of that because ultimately they're, that's not what their goal is. Um, so that's pretty much what a price level does. It just it just separates your customers list into specific segments where, um, again, like I said, commercial, right? Corporations, they have the money. Though they are willing to pay a large amount for your service. So that's what you that's that's pretty much what uh, a price level does. It just it just helps you separate your customers into different categories, and it allows you to build a price point based on their circumstances. That's all at price levels is. Um, I don't think, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, uh, skip on this one. Um, okay. Next we have our, uh, I, already I already talked about that. Uh, other ones that we have is custom fields. Okay. So when we talk about other things on the list, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, briefly go over that just so that you don't feel like I'm not gi giving you everything. So here, all right. So the next one is going to be um, fixed assets inventory. Okay. That's definitely going to be more advanced users of, of QuickBooks for that. Sales tax codes. We learned that in chapter two. Payroll items, we learned that in chapter 10. Class list, we learned that in chapter 4, and we also learned that in chapter 2 as well. 
All right, so these are things that we're going to be looking forward in the future for, okay? So other name list. Now, this is one that a lot of people don't know what you use other names list, right? Others names list is for anybody who isn't your vendor, who isn't your customer, and who isn't your employee. So what 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 kind of name would you think would fit here? If they're not a <laughs> say that again. Not one of your vendors, not one of your customers, and definitely not an employee. Well, I think you is it gonna be too obvious like it should be other? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking you what could what, what would be an example of an other name that you can think of? Who else would would you put would you categorize as an other name besides that someone that it cannot be a vendor? It cannot be a customer, and it cannot be an employee. So who can actually be part of the other names list? All right, I'll, I'll okay, go. Contractor. Okay, contractors are going to be considered your vendors. Okay. Right? I'll go ahead and give it to you. It's okay. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to put you on uh, the spot, but um, it could be anybody such as the owner of the company. Right? Oh, the, okay. Yeah. The owner can't be a vendor, obviously. The owner can definitely not be a customer. Why would you sell yourself this a product? You could just right. take it. <laughs> Um, and of course the owner absolutely cannot work for the company because I believe that's, um, unless it's a corporation, of course, you can be part owner by having a share, but you can also work as part of it. But that's called, um, I believe that's called, uh, stock options, um, where you can only be part ownership of the company or own shares of an ownership if you agree because you're working there that's considered a stock option. It's going to be more for a benefit for you as a retirement plan. Um, but you can't technically own um, sh shares and work for the company without that bottom line right there because that's technically illegal because you can you could potentially make the company make a million dollars and what? Aha, I get to take all million dollars. Mm. Well then, you know. But yes, owners, partners... Um, so if you're in a partnership, you can list all those people that are under there. Um, especially if you are dealing with a partner who is silent, you definitely want to make sure you add their name in there. Um, other things, too, could be, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say or wouldn't think it'd be um, a, a part of this, but any family members that work for your company could actually be uh, listed here because they're technically family. Even though they are your employees, um, they can technically be um, an other name because they have a family or they could be part owner of the company. I don't, I, I mean, specific wise, um, you're owner of the company. So, yes. Um, yeah. So any owners, any partners that are involved in your company. Um, and yeah. Nothing that you can put in. It can't be anybody that's on your payroll except for the uh, uh, condition that you, it could be a family member here. All right. All right. But that's what others list is. Let me see. Um, customers and vendors. We'll talk about these, of course, uh, when we dive into those chapters. So chapter four, which is tomorrow, is going to be dealing primarily with your vendors. Okay. And we're going to be looking at expenses. So, um, and yep. Yeah, and we'll talk about templates in a second as well. So now that that is all out of the way, we're going to talk about custom fields. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll talk about uh, your custom fields. And then we'll talk about templates in a second. So... With that being said, now this is actually, I don't know why they have this as part of chapter seven. Um, it makes sense because chapter four and chapter two has already passed over. 
Um, but it is it does have to deal with that kind of concept where when you enter in your new um, people into your list, that's where custom fields will come into play, okay? So when we're talking about entering in um, a custom field, let me, let me, let me just I close out all these windows. So I'm going to go ahead and use a vendor, for example, okay? Um, and we'll talk about this tomorrow as well. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new, um, a new vendor, okay? Um, so, of course, when you are creating your vendor, you're going to have the basic information, the basic line of information that you can gather um, from your vendor. So usually it's their, um, it's, if it's a business, you're going to have their name, obviously the company name, their address, where you're getting the stuff from telephone number, email, et cetera, et cetera. Any, uh, payment options, terms, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we go to additional information, right, you'll have this small section right here on the right side that says custom fields and notice this. The first thing that we have here in gray is your county. So that is definitely something that you would normally not see in a general information from your vendors, right? It's not something that you list out because that's going to be something that's custom to that particular person, right? Now, let's go ahead and click on define fields, all right? Now, this is where my list of things that I want to know about a particular person. And if you look at this column here on the right side, you have your customers, your vendors, and you have your employees. Now, what these essentially generally do is as you build your relationship with a vendor, customer, and or employee, you tend to pick up information that could be important for your future when it comes into building your relationship. So we always say, right, um, the best way to get into the company is by knowing someone in the company, right? That's exactly what this is used for. If you know someone in the company, right, and you can spark a conversation, especially when you can bring up something that they love to do, you're ultimately strengthening your bond and your relationship because they're going to treat you more like a friend versus a customer, all right? You're going to build a relationship. They'll do favors for you because they know you so well and you would do a favor for them in return. So vice versa. So this is actually a good strategy to build a relationship, but also uh, for important things as well, such as if, for example, if I were to, um, um, uh, we'll talk about this tomorrow as well, when you, in relationships to a vendor, right, they might invent, they might invite you to their company party, right, or they might, um, you know, they might be established, um, you know, or having their, um, so for example, PETA, they just had their 10-year anniversary last year in September, there's something, that's a piece of information I can use because I can send them a gift. I could say, congratulations. I'm, you know, your business has been thriving for 10 years. Congratulations. I can send a thank you card or I mean, sorry, a congratulations or, you know, um, an anniversary card, an anniversary gift. Those things are very going to be very important because again, it's going to strengthen your relationship with your um, vendor. Same thing with a customer, right? Maybe you know their spouse's name and then every time you meet them in person, you say, hey, how are you doing? How's your wife, Linda? And they'll be like, oh, you remember her? You know, so on and so forth. Or if, you know, as I, I don't mean to generate ge generalize this, but most men, right, they love sports. You, you, you have a conversation with one of your customers or one of your vendors and you say, and you see that they are, um, I don't know, a Raiders fan because we're in Vegas, right? Oh, you're a Raiders fan? Oh, that's so great. So you love, you love this and love that, right? And then you might, you know, initiate a conversation or, hey, you want to go to a bar? Let's go watch the Raiders game after work, things like that. So again, same thing. And that also applies with your employees too especially your employees. You want to make a safe haven for them to work 
and not have a hostile environment. You always want your your employees definitely want to have, uh, you know, or you, you they expect that they want the company that they're working for to pay attention to them, to care for them, to uh, listen to what their needs are. And the most important way to make a good relationship and to hold on to them if they're if they're kind of they're you know um, make them a good employee or a trustworthy employee is you gather information. What's your dog's name? Your dog's name's Willie. Okay, cool. How's your dog Willie? Right. So all of these custom fields, what they're really meant to do is they they're they're extra information that you will learn about a particular person. All right. And your only categories are is your cus your customers, your vendors, and your employees. And here's the catch: you can only create fifteen of them. Now you're probably thinking, fifteen, fifteen. That, so that means I have to create 15 for my, um, for my vendors, 15 for my customers, and 15 for my employees. That's a total of 45. And then here's another catch. You can only use seven on, a, on each person. You can only have seven of them. That doesn't make sense. How can I use seven of them when I can have up to 15? Because and that's exactly what this table is for. My, I have here, right, I can create as many information as I want. I, uh, for obviously, um, title is more geared towards your um, vendors, right? But for example, right, I could put hobbies, right? Hobbies can apply to all three. So in this case, you can only have a maximum of seven, but you can interchange or you can have one um, custom field that can apply to all three, right? And then obviously you're going to have other ones that don't apply to all three. Like you don't have to uh, create a custom field that is meant for all three, but you have up to 15. Now you don't want to spend all 15 on one particular person, right? Like one vendor. You want to make sure like, is this something that I can use for multiple people. But in this case, most cases, um, what happens here is um, there'll be like a business establi establishment, right? Business establishment date. Who is that going to apply to? That's definitely going to only apply to my vendor. All right. Um, spouse's name, okay? In this case, it just says that it's only for your, um, your vendor, I mean, for your employees, but you could definitely have it for your vendor and you could definitely have it for your customer because obviously that's the great way to keep, um, uh, contact with your customers. You always ask them about their significant other. General rule of thumb. Absolutely. That's the best that's the best conversation starter too. How's your wife doing? All of that on a Rolodex. Yes, it is exactly. And of course, obviously, you're not going to memorize every single customer's wife's name or significant or spouse's name. And that's what the great thing about QuickBooks is if you're having a conversation with them, you pull up their file, you'll be like, oh, How's your wife, Linda? You know, that's 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 the whole purpose of this. It's basically data collecting. Um, so there you go. And if I go ahead and click OK, um, and then I click OK, don't display this message again. Now my custom fields is built a little bigger because I selected um, th four things on that list that I can apply to my vendor. And of course, because they're customizable, you can enter in anybody's name, anything. So hobby could be one. What if this vendor is interested in fishing? Type in fishing, <laughs> you know? So yes, the, the, and that's what custom fields are meant for. And um, one thing I, I did not mention is that you can also have custom items as well. So for example, when I talked about um, the chart of accounts, right? So we go ahead and click that cancel button real quick. What, remember when we talked about the chart of accounts yesterday? That's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I thought you were asking a question. Do you remember when we talked about it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so notice this. I told you there's only five types of accounts, right? Mm -hmm. 
Why is it my, I have a bank account as a type? Why do I have um, loans as a special type of type? Because you can also customize your um, your um, your items as well. Or in this case, you can customize how many um, things that you have here. So in this case, my assets can be broken down into even further categories such as bank. I mean, I don't have to use bank. I can actually change that and make it in terms of, um, you know, um, I, well, I can't think of any other word besides bank. Uh, and then here they have accounts receivable. And here they have other current assets. In reality, if we look at all of this, these are all considered con current assets. Now here's a catch for this as well. You only have the maximum of five customizable fields for items. So under my account type um, assets, I can only have five, five categories. All right. Um, when you learn in a real accounting, you learn that there's only actually two, there's only actually three. So again, my current assets can be broken down into five other you know sections. I have a bank. I have accounts receivable. I have maybe I need to do a savings account, um, and then my next one is going to be um, um, cash on hand. That's a good one, right? I can create, but only up to five for each category or for each item. So again, I have a total of five account types. I can have five in each one. So um, I can break down my, ass my assets into five different categories. And then I can break down each category, breaking it down to even five more items. All right. So in this case, this one's, um, uh, you can customize only up to five when it comes to items. But when it comes to fields for um, people, it's only, you have a, a total of 15, but you can only apply seven for each one, okay? And uh, yep, that's it for that section there, okay? All right, next section is going to be, uh, I believe it is the very last section, is that we actually are going to be talking about how to customize your templates. So, of course, obviously, the first thing that you want to do is when you're coming into a company is you want to make sure that you deck out all the invoices and you, you want to make it so then each thing that you send out or each thing that you print out, it's custom to your company. All right. And the most notable one is going to be your sales receipt or sales form. All right, so I'm going to go to lists, right? And I'm going to go to templates. So here is the list of all the items that you can customize or um, forms. We'll call them forms. Um, so here you can customize an invoice. You can customize a credit memo. You can even customize a sales receipt, which we'll talk about each and individual what they are. Um, but in this case, you're pretty you're pretty straightforward what a um, invoice is and a sales receipt is, right? Oh yeah. You can even customize your own purchase orders, okay? Um, and you can even customize your estimates and your statements. The only thing you absolutely cannot customize is obviously your bill. Because, you know, it comes into the mail. Are you going to are you going to go look up the the, the vendor's uh, logo and customize their bill? No, you, you don't have to. You just plug it into your uh, your your bills. There's no reason for you to have to customize a bill. Um, and you can definitely never customize a check. OK, checks are standard and universal. You make one change to it, there could be many um, uh, consequences to that. Especially yeah, because... the routing and number and stuff like that. Absolutely. And on top of that, you have to go buy special paper. You can't just print out a check just the way it is. You have to order the special seal, you know, the holographic uh, logo that... Uh-huh. It has to be special. So 
Um, I know for, and then on top of that, most companies, what they do is they can customize it for you with your company logo on it. But that has to come from the bank. You cannot do it on your own. Okay. So that's going to be, has to be something that you have to deal with your bank for. So with that being said, you can only have a few options. So anything that's customizable for you. So most likely something that you send to your customers is definitely going to be something that you are, um, can customize and you should customize it, especially let's take a look at this. Let's look, let's take a look at this, um, um, into it. Um, no, not packages it into it product invoice or was that though? Is that the one? Yes. Let's, yeah, Intuit product um, invoice. Look how boring and stale that, that invoice looks, looks. Am I right? It's so boring. It's plain. There's no colors. There's no company logo. It just looks like someone, um, you know, um, took this from an Excel sheet and just printed it out. Okay. But. I've actually seen that one, I think. Yes, yes, yes. It's actually uh, a funny thing is for people who use um, Intuit, you're going to notice that most of the invoices are going to look all standard. They're all going to look the same because they're also lazy too. And the only thing they'll change is they'll, they'll just type in their company logo or, or they'll add their company logo or they'll just add their, they'll just type in their name. Now, of course, that's why I'm saying here that they recommend you if you are planning to do something like this, they recommend you to make a copy of it because one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to accidentally send your customer um, a statement or an invoice if it's missing the amount number. So that's the one thing that you're doing when you're building a customized uh, template, which you can do. You can create a template on by scratch, but the most oftentimes happens is People forget a certain thing. There's just too many things to remember. Oh, I need to add in their item. I need to add in the description. I need to add their quantity. I need to add their total. I need to add when they bought it. I also need to uh, indicate how much it cost. I need, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I'll talk about you also have to, the shipping package, where to go, where, who is it to, all, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of details when it comes to building an invoice. Now, of course, like I said, you can build a custom one, of course, by going down to the bottom window and clicking a new template, okay? But they always recommend you, you should just use the one that Intuit has already built for you because that way you don't miss something, all right? So here it is. So here, let's go ahead and take a look at what you can do uh, when you're customizing this. So of course, you can even customize what you want to have on your um, on your invoice. Okay, let's start from the very top. So the first thing is, what are you going to title this um, invoice um, thing? So right now, it's it says it is um, called Intuit Product um, Invoice. I can go ahead and click that Manage button, and I can go right here and change the title to whatever name I want it to be. So in this case, it's it's grayed out. So let me let me let me go ahead and close out this one, and um, it won't let me edit it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually I'm gonna make a copy of it. So I'm going to right click it and I'm going to um, make a custom columns. Oh, where is it? Uh, create. Huh. Let me go down to the bottom. Uh, there should be a way for. Oh, no, it's right here. That's something different. Oh. No, no, it's something different. I want to make a copy of it. So here I go. I make a duplicate. And then what is it? It's an invoice. Okay. So now, now you have, you have a um, copy of this one. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and um, double click on this one. And I'm going to modify this one because I think that one is standard. So it won't let you, it's like, uh, you can't delete it. You can't modify it. So I'm going to click that manage uh, template and I'm going to change the name and I'm going to name this whatever you want to name it to be. So in this case, I'm going to say this is Academy um, Photography Invoice 1 because I don't know, I'm just going to name it like that. So again, when you're in this section here, you can choose what columns you want to have displayed on here. And of course, you want to keep everything just because 
Um, this is a standard invoice. So you don't want to ruin or delete anything that you don't need, that you, 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 you want to keep everything, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So here now it has changed my um, title for it. Okay, so now it says that it's my Academy Photography invoice number one. So I know where to locate it. Okay. Now the next section says that you want to use a logo. Of course I want to use a logo. So when you click that, it's going to ask you to go to your documents to find your company logo. And if it's actually included in your, um, your student portable file. So they do, it does come with it as well. So I'm going to go ahead and locate that. So let me see. Um, QuickBooks portable files, the fundamentals. And then there you go. Here I have signature and I have logo. So I'm going to choose logo. And it's going to give you this little message. You're going to click OK. And then look, did you see that? That's my company logo. At least it's better than just typing in your name. All right. And again, everything is as is. All right. So that's the next step there. Then now the next step is going to be selecting a color scheme. So again, if it's... Um, if your company is a specific color, right, let's say, um, I'm going to say Academy of Photography is actually, huh, huh, I don't know what Academy of Photography is. I'm going to say it's maroon, maroon, black, and white. So if I click on that, if you look very, very, very carefully, sorry, it's really hard to see this. It's right, there you go. It changed the borders and everything into the color scheme maroon. All right? So that's what's really cool. So like, I like a lot of invoices, right? If um, I know that blue is a generic color that most logos or most companies kind of associate with. So it, for this case, into its green. Um, but yeah, you can change the color scheme on that. But there's the, you can't select the color um, itself or like personalize the color. It has to be whatever set standard in their options um but i don't know i don't really like that so i'm gonna go place it back into black <laughs> excuse me so again you can even change the fonts and font colors for each one all right but you have to change it through this right here window where it says change font so here um i want to change my company name all right so we click that change font and of course it gives you a little um, display of what that does. So I'm going to choose something that looks a little uh, unique over here. Um, and oh, that's a good one right here. Okay. Um, of course, the size of this is uh, it's a little too big. So I'm going to make it look a little smaller. Maybe size 10 is good. And uh, I, I, do I want it in uh, the font color to be black? Sure. Why not? Or in this case, I'll probably make it maroon because that's the color of my um, company. And I'm going to click OK. Once I do that, now if you look carefully, um, it should be, it changed the font, but you can barely see the color change there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, yes, yeah, so we change. Okay, now there's, there's also options for you to include something or not if you want to have it. So this is for the company title at the very top. So we chose that, yes, you should have the company name displayed, of course. They need to know that your customers need to know where they bought this from. Um, they said that you need the company address, of course. You're billing them, so you definitely need an address. Other things, do you need a fax number? So it's optional. In this case, probably not. I probably won't need it. Okay, so I'm going to uncheck that. Uh, do I want my email address? Why not? So they can email me. Okay, I would love to put my phone number too because so that instead of contacting me um, by sending me mail, they can contact me directly with the phone number. And maybe I do a website uh, address. Now notice this, it's actually at the bottom. Okay, if you look very, very carefully, here's my phone number, um, here's my email address, and my website's right here. Okay, so they kind of, they kind of place them in, the, in, in, in other ways as well. So once you've figured this out and you like how it looks, go ahead and um, 
save, you could close and save it. Uh, wait, let me pull up this at the bottom. There you go. There you go. Now you see your um, save for that, okay? Now, of course, this is too small to be able to determine whether you did this nicely or not. So you can actually click the print preview so you can see it at a little closer up, okay? So, of course, uh, if you want the top part, does that look good? Okay, does my bottom part look good? See my phone number there, my email address, and my website. So that looks all good to me. So I can go ahead and close out of this. All right, come on, QuickBooks. Oh, no, I didn't click. I think I hit um, help instead. My bad. So there you go. Click close. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So now every time I use my um, standard uh, Academy Photography invoicing, so we'll take a look at this when we, made, when we build our invoicing, okay? So if I were to go to, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter two, but I'll briefly show it for you real quick. Um, so here, if I go to my invoice and I create an invoice, it's going to uh, show up this, and the first thing it's going to ask, or the I mean, third thing it's going to ask me is, what kind of template are you going to be using? That's where I can go ahead and grab my, uh, where is it, my Photography Academy invoice number one. So when I print this, of course, it's not going to show me that, uh, but when I print it, it's going to be exactly how I had my template, which is the, the, um, the one I just, we just went over, okay? So we'll talk about this uh, on uh, next week. Okay. All right. So that was chapter. Uh, that was chapter uh, chapter seven. That's it. Okay. So before we go into the review questions, do you have any questions in regards to chapter seven? Uh, I think I'm good. I'm getting better to follow in the book and getting where I need to be at now. Okay, so again, um, like I said, usually the first week it's not really navigate. It's not really um, uh, what do you call it? Not much that you could um, physically do. Exactly, not much hands off. But when we dive into chapter four, which is tomorrow, when we start practicing entering invoices, entering your sales receipt. <coughs> excuse me, entering all these information. So from here on out, that's why I usually say the first. The first week is usually you are going in. Your the whole pro the whole pro, um, purpose of that first week is get your QuickBooks downloaded as soon as possible. Sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes, like I said, um, you should expect an email anytime between twenty four to forty eight hours. My last class, they waited a whole like three days before they got theirs. So, usually rule of thumb is. First week is not really hands-on. It's more lecture, 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 showing you what you can do. But once that's over, so chapter four is going to be our first time where we're looking at entering in our bills. Once we understand how to do one transaction, you'll be able to do every single transaction after that because it's literally, it's rinse and repeat, just like entering in my um, items list. Every single item that you enter was pretty much rinse and repeat. It's the same thing, except you're just entering in different information. Okay? Okay. So before I, we go over the review sh the review questions, I do want you to also know this part too, because it is part of a uh, previous chapter, so chapter 12. Um, we were talking about what happens when I need to set up a user and a password. So again, if we go to here and we go to set up users and um, passwords, right? We're going to click set up users. Now, of course, you have to be the admin in order to set up the user. So it's going to ask you, so what's the password to this account? Let me know. Let QuickBooks wants you to know, are you truly the, um, the admin of this uh, work uh, book? And if you are, you're the only one that can um, allow access to this. Okay, it says invalid password. My bad. I think I typed, mistyped something. Okay, so capital S L E E T E R A T N. There you go. So once you um, uh, validate that you are an admin, now you're actually going to start creating your users. So again, 
it really depends on what position that you have for your person, okay? So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and make a username, and I'm going to say maybe this person is HR. So their username is going to be HR. Easy, simple. And their password is going to be payroll. Capital P A Y R O L L. Payroll. Simple. All right. Confirm password. So again, I need to type it in. So capital P A Y R O L L. And I'm going to click next. So now it's going to ask you a series of questions on how much access they can actually have for the QuickBooks. So as you, as you remember, right, every position, as a uh, person who has um, access to everything in QuickBooks, you're more likely to be the admin, the accountant, the, the, the owner. But in reality, you don't want to have all that information and all that clutter for everyone to see. You want to limit access for certain uh, users because it's not relevant to them. They don't need to know um, sales if they're the if they're HR, unless you know they're doing commissions. Or you don't need to ha to have someone in purchasing or inventory manager. They don't need to know how much sales you're ha you're doing. They don't. Okay. So with that being said, so now we clicked. We said that this is HR. Right. We said that they're mainly focused on payroll. So the question is, is what do you want this user to have access to? And in this case, obviously, we're not going to have them have access to the sales because what does that have to do with them? What does purchasing have to do with payroll? Nothing. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose this option right here saying that they are going to be selected, selected certain areas in QuickBooks. And I'm going to go ahead and click next. So this one's a pretty much a series of questions. They're just going to ask you, do they have access to this? And your, your, your answer is either yes or no. So the first one is what kind of level of access of sales and accounts receivable do they have? No access right next all right um what kind of level of access do they have for purchases and accounts payable no access all right um what kind of level of access do they have with the checking and credit card transactions of course with payroll you need to know um checking at least so in this case i'm going to say they need some access so they can they're able to create transactions only or are they able to um, create and print um, uh, transactions they might be able to do both just because they might be they, they could be the ones that print the checks as well all right next one is what kind of level of access is for inventory activities none this is this is HR they have nothing to do with inventory what level of access do they have to time tracking full access because they need to be able to see the timesheets that people put in. Other than that, what kind of level of access is payroll? Full access, because that's what we, that's what HR does. They deal with um, all of that. What about sensitive account and um, activities um, such as that? Okay, do you want them to give them access? In this case, do they need to be um, to have access to sensitive information? Um, I would say full access because you do need to have their W two numbers for their social security. Oh, so their, their social security numbers, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to, them to have full access. So I'm gonna go ahead and click next. All right. Um, last but least, you have what is the uh, level of access for sensitive um, financial reports? Mm, financial reports, no, because they're just dealing with payroll. All right, do you want this user to have um, the ability to charge or start to change um, and um, delete transactions? Absolutely. Um, especially like if they make a mistake in their checks, 
I would say uh, that's it. That's it. That's that's uh, going to be a question that you're going to have to uh, encounter. Do you want yeah. this person to have access to delete them? Our our rule of thumb is you shouldn't delete anything. But you know what? I'll just give them access to do that. Um, so they can go in and change like timekeeping. They can go in like if they left early that day because they had a doctor's appointment. Absolutely. Fills in eight hours. You know, regard yeah, once you clock in, uh-huh. fills in eight hours and then. Well, they did have to leave it, so they have to change that and then charge that off to a different account. Exactly, and then they don't need to bother the admin to be like, hey, I need to make a change to your timesheet or something like, you know. So, yes, I want them to full have full access before the closing date, so that's important. And we'll talk about what the closing date does. It essentially locks your data file up. So in this case, no, I absolutely don't want them to change anything that happened in the past. Okay, because their payroll... They're not, they're not the accountant. The accountant should be the only one that has access to change anything that has been in the past. All right, so in this case, no. I will not let them change anything in the past. So here they give you a review on what kind of uh, rights they have or access and levels and whatnot. And, um, I mean, it can change over time, but realistically... For payroll, you're not gonna you're not gonna make that much changes. They're still gonna be dealing with certain things. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and click finish. So now I have an HR account. So when you log into this file, right? You you, you know when it pops up and says you need to enter in a password. Mm-hmm. That's where you enter in instead of Sleater 18 because that's the admin password. You're just gonna type in payroll. And QuickBooks is going to automatically know that it's HR who's trying to log into the um, file. So there you go. I've created that. And that's it. And again, if I were to log into HR, I would I would see just only payroll available. Okay. okay. All right. So, so will that change your, your homepage at all? Is- Absolutely, absolutely, because you're, you're not going to see anything in sales and you're not going to see anything in your inventory. You're only going to be looking at this particular part right here. So in other sense, your whole entire home page is going to be limited to just this section right here. Got it. Okay, and of course, you're only going to be having access to your the checking because we gave admin rights to say that um, they can print out and use the checking. So yes. All right. All right. So we're good on time as well. It's exactly uh, for uh, 24. So let's go over those questions quickly. So let's okay. go for it. So question number one. Okay. When you, um, you can create custom fields for. D, yes, people. We talked about people, right? And we, um, yes, so anybody that is um, a customer, a vendor, and of course, um, we don't do um, templates, right? So the answer is both A and C, which is your people. Good. Number two, okay, what two types of preferences are there? User and company preferences. Absolutely. Good. All right. Not user and accountant and definitely not um, favorite. (laughs) Um, But yes. Anyways, number three. Okay. If you don't see the favorites menu in your menu uh, bar, you can do, you can turn it on through what? You can't do it in the custom. No, 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 no. So... Mm-hmm. Okay, it'd be the view window? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is actually on the view menu. So again, just a little refresher here. If I don't see my favorites icon, if I go to view, I have the option right here um, to dis... Oh, where is it? Oh, okay, so view... Wrong one, sorry, it's on the list. I have the little option right here that says favorites menu. So if I were to uncheck that, right, I don't see it. But if I go to view and I check mark that um, favorites menu, it appears. There it is. Yes. Okay. 
So, yes. Okay. Um, and then, let's see. Number four. Which of the following is not an available template type that you, um, in QuickBooks? Because we were just talking about that. Check. Mm -hmm. Check. Absolutely. You cannot, you cannot um, update a check. Okay. And then lastly, number five, if you pay sales tax to more than one agency, you should use which of the following items? More than one. Um, A, your sales tax group. Yes, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about that as well. You only create a sales tax item um, if you pay to one agency and one agency only. So if you end up having to pay for um, your, your, your state and your county tax to one agency, go ahead and just write down the 8.38%, whatever, whatever the rate is. But if you're paying to more than two agencies or more than one in this case, um, then yes, you have to pay your state separately and your county separately, you would use your sales tax group. All right. Good job. All right. Any questions in regards to chapter two? I'm sorry, chapter seven and chapter 12. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I was thinking about 12 and I said two instead. I, I, I need to go back and review some things tonight and stuff. But Perfect. I don't think I have any at the moment. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm going to have to record the, um, the second part of chapter 12 um, mm -hmm. over the weekend. Uh, so if you could just be patient, um, it should be up uh, book by Monday. So you'll have that definitely to review.